Early morning light streamed through narrow cracks in the wooden Venetian shutters. Olivia Hammond rolled onto her side and spent a moment admiring the way the sun's rays shimmered on her husband's naked torso. At 33, he was still in great shape and certainly didn't perpetuate the stereotype of the skinny computer nerd. She ran her gaze over his body and smiled. Stephen covered his eyes with his hand, blocking out the light. Olivia was sure that Stephen was like a puppy and could sleep anywhere and in any position. She looked at the clock, standing by the bed. There were twenty minutes left before the alarm went off. A sly smile slowly spread across her face. There was plenty of time for quick sex. Imperceptibly slipping her hand under the blanket, she unmistakably felt what she was looking for. She smiled when he immediately began to answer. Stephen could always be relied upon, and relied upon well. The sex was mind-blowing as always, and Olivia got everything she wanted in abundance. I'm gonna miss you, baby, Olivia said, her back to her husband. The hot streams of the shower pleasantly washed over her chest and stomach. You can always cancel the trip, he replied, continuing to wash her back with a huge washcloth. Olivia sighed. You know I'd rather be here with you and the girls, but I'm so close to making this deal that I can taste it. If I pull it off, it will mean another bonus of 250000 This will be the second award this year. Think of the pleasure we can get from this. It was Stephen's turn to sigh. Years of experience told him that it was useless to argue with her or ask what they needed more money for. He was once the biggest earner in their family, but that time has long passed. Olivia was now easily ahead of him. She was ambitious and strived for success. For her, it wasn't about the money. It wasn't even a matter of negotiations. She looked closely at the victim, determined his weak points, and then developed a strategy to exploit them. She was a hunter. She was interested in victory, in the deal. Always a deal. Even when one deal was on the verge of being achieved, she was already planning the next one. I know... And I also know that you will succeed. You have the Midas touch. Everything you touch turns to gold. Olivia laughed. Midas touch. I like it. Not a bad asset for a merchant banker, don't you think? In response, Stephen kissed his wife's neck. Here. My turn, he said, pushing the washcloth into Olivia's hand. He moved them so that he was face to face with the stream from the shower head. He put his hands on the cool tiles and, closing his eyes, directed his face at an angle to the stream. Under the click-clack of Olivia's heels, Stephen poured coffee, black with one. He moved the cup to an empty spot on the kitchen counter and winked at his six-year-old daughters. They giggled. What are you laughing at? Olivia asked as she kissed each of their heads and sat down on the bar stool next to Haley. Over you, Mommy? Hannah replied, giggling. Yes, said Haley. Dad says you can't do anything until you drink coffee. Olivia paused, the edge of her cup pressing against her lower lip for a moment, and she pulled it away without taking a sip, turning the cup this way and that, looking at it as if she was seeing it for the first time. Haley and Hannah giggled as they ate their cereal. I think your dad may be right. Olivia said, suppressing a smile. I think I better have a cup. Otherwise, who's going to braid your hair? Daddy? No! The girls squealed in unison. Dad is terrible at braiding hair. And last time he forgot our ribbons, Haley added. Oh, the shame, the endless shame of forgotten ribbons, cried Stephen, dramatically dropping his face into his hands. All his girls laughed at his antics. Stephen became serious and pulled his women along with him. Not for the first time. I mentally compared it to trying to herd chickens. Once the girls started school, which meant Olivia would go back to work, Stephen would usually get the girls up, dressed, and fed. Olivia was doing the finishing touches. Hair and ribbons. If there was no morning meeting or urgent business, Stephen drove the girls to school. Olivia's office was in the opposite direction. Today, when school was on holiday, and therefore there was no need to take his daughters, Stephen arranged to drive Olivia to the airport so that she could catch a flight to Melbourne. 
She and several other senior bank officials were negotiating a multi-million dollar deal with a large multinational corporation. The girls got to spend the day at the zoo with Mrs. Foster. Mrs. Foster was a godsend and had been with them since the girls were born. Stephen was initially reluctant to hire someone to help Olivia take care of her daughters in the house, having grown up in a blue-collar family with a stay-at-home mother, but Olivia was persistent. If she had to take a break from her career to care for the girls, she wanted to improve her education at the same time. Because Mrs. Foster lived in the granny flat on the property and did most of the cooking and cleaning, Olivia was able to study online, adding an economics degree to her accounting degree and also earning an MBA. Stephen readily admitted that his doubts were unfounded. Olivia was a good, if not entirely practical mother, and Mrs. Foster had proved more than once how valuable she was. She cleaned, looked after the girls if they were sick, looked after them after school and holidays, babysat the children when necessary, and on weekdays, she prepared delicious and nutritious food for the whole family. Haley and Hannah adored her, considering her a pseudo-grandmother. While Olivia was straightening the girl's hair, Stephen quickly cleared away the dishes, as he felt it would be wrong to leave such things in Mrs. Foster's care. Stephen heard the back door open and smiled. Mrs. Foster, as always, had chosen the perfect moment. After kisses and the usual warnings to his daughters to be good, cheerful, and do everything Mrs. Foster told them, Stephen took Olivia's bag and headed to the garage. The bag seemed heavy to him, but he did not comment. Olivia was Olivia, and he knew that she had packed things for every possible occasion. The lights in the garage were dim, but Stephen didn't turn on the lights. They weren't going to stay long. He stuffed the bag into the trunk of their four-wheel drive and then stepped aside to open the passenger door for Olivia. She slipped inside, placing her briefcase and purse on the floor at her feet. As the garage door slowly rose, Olivia began chatting. I wonder if that coffee shop you know, the one with the bicycles hanging on the wall, still exists on Berkeley Street. Don't know. Maybe. It's been seven years since we left. A lot can happen during this time, Stephen answered gloomily. He didn't like being reminded of the time they lived in Melbourne. Olivia continued oblivious to Stephen's changed mood. I really hope it's still working. They make the best coffee there. And their cupcakes were simply incredible. Olivia laughed. Maybe I'll even allow myself to eat one. Since the birth of her girls, Olivia has been fanatically watching her carbohydrate intake. Her vigilance meant that the whole family was on guard. Poor Mrs. Foster had to learn new recipes and adapt old ones to make the low-carb dinners Olivia demanded. Stephen made a token attempt to smile, but the smile did not reach his eyes. Perhaps I should try to bring one for you, my love. As I recall, you were very partial to raspberries, cream cheese, and white chocolate. Yes, I was, Stephen agreed dryly, navigating the local streets on autopilot. But I think you saved me from this weakness. Olivia's happy glow faded. She frowned. It lasted only a brief moment. Then she brightened. Well, I may have to find a new sin for you to enjoy. It will be a surprise. I'm sure it will be so. Stephen took his foot off the gas pedal allowing the car to slow as it approached the intersection that led them out of the quiet suburban neighborhood. To the left, to the city, to the right, to the airport. When there were 30 meters left to the intersection, Stephen moved the indicator lever to the down position. Plans change, old man. Turn left. Stephen and Olivia reacted instinctively to the hoarse voice that came from behind them. Olivia screamed, Turning in her seat towards the voice, Stephen grabbed the steering wheel with both hands and slammed on the brakes. They screamed in protest. The car vibrated and then braked suddenly, causing all the passengers to be thrown forward and then back into their seats. Who are you? Olivia screamed, looking at the gun pointed at them. What do you need? Stephen shouted at the same time. One question at a time, guys, the attacker chuckled, clearly enjoying their fear and confusion. Who I am is your worst nightmare. But what I want is more complicated. You have to ask, why? 
Why should you do what I want? Why? Stephen croaked, clutching the steering wheel as if his life depended on it. Actually, there are two reasons. I have a gun. What other reason? Oh, yes. I have your daughter's. Pandemonium reigned. Olivia squealed. Stephen screamed, tried to unfasten himself, and reached for the intruder. Their captor just sat there smiling. Well, guys, are you done? He asked cheerfully, as Olivia and Stephen finally fell into an awkward silence. How do we know that you have our daughters? Asked Stephen. They went to the zoo with Mrs. Foster, Olivia added in a challenging tone. Indeed? Are you sure about this, Mrs.? The man rubbed his chin and cheeks, his fingers running over the three-day stubble, making a soft crunching sound. The sound brought Olivia's attention to his face. She held her breath. Other than the sunglasses, he made no attempt to hide his identity. Her stomach churned. Would she, Stephen, and their daughters survive this day? Two cars pulled up from behind and honked their horns. Better hurry up. Turn left. For what? Where are you taking us? When I want, I'll tell you, the man growled, jabbing the gun into Stephen's side. Now turn left. Stephen followed the instructions. Now give me your phone numbers, calm and slow. No kidding. He put them in his vest pocket. The vest bulged out. Olivia swallowed hard, her imagination working overtime, imagining what other things he kept in his various pockets. And one more, he told Olivia, snapping his fingers. She tried to look innocent and embarrassed. Did not work out. Stop talking nonsense, missus. Give me your second phone, the one in your briefcase. Olivia lifted her briefcase onto her lap, opened it, and took out her phone. She handed it to the man over her shoulder. During this entire incident, she avoided meeting Stephen's gaze. She felt how he kept looking from the road to her and back. His eyes seemed to burn holes into her skin. Do you have a second phone? Stephen's voice was tense with anger. Now is not the time to talk about this, Stephen. The man behind him chuckled. Yes, Stephen. Now is not the time to start a domestic showdown or question your wife about why she has a second phone that she didn't tell you about. Stephen looked closely at the man in the rearview mirror. Now is the time to do what you're told. I wouldn't want anything terrible to happen to these sweet girls of yours. You can't take them away. They left for the whole day. They left at the same time as us. There was a note of challenge in Olivia's voice. I do not believe you. You are lying. I'm lying, right? The man growled. He raised the phone to eye level, his eyes darting between the screen and Olivia's face. He pressed a few buttons and handed the phone to Olivia. A quick glance at the screen when Olivia picked up the phone confirmed her worst fears. The man knew their home number. How could this happen? He was not listed on the phone list. Olivia gasped, struggling to catch her breath. She fought off panic when she heard Mrs. Foster's voice. She didn't look like herself at all. Usually this woman was calm and confident, but not now. Now she was shaking and hesitant, as if on the verge of tears. Olivia felt as if someone was squeezing her chest. Hello? Mrs. Foster? This is Olivia? Oh God, I'm so sorry. We are with them. Oh God, they're having girls. I am so sorry. I couldn't stop them. Olivia dropped the phone into her lap as if it had burned her and howled in horror. The sound was shrill, like that of an animal struggling in agony. Both men flinched. Yes, Stephen, they have the girls. Olivia sobbed, her shoulders shaking. Stephen hit the steering wheel. What do you need from us? Why are you doing it? Aren't we wildly rich and famous? For what? Rich enough, techie. Now give the phone back, missus. What do you have in mind? What would you like? Just tell us, Olivia begged, handing the man the phone. We'll do anything. Just don't touch our girls. That's exactly what I want to hear. Now, Stevie boy, take us to the National Australia Bank on Liverpool Street. Olivia and Stephen exchanged glances. This was their bank. So, kids, how much money are we talking about? How many pennies did you two manage to save? Stephen opened his mouth to speak, but Olivia beat him to it. About 250,000. Give or take a little. 
Stephen closed his eyes for a split second longer than just blinking. He held his breath. Yes, 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 missus. Have you already forgotten your little statement you made just a few minutes ago? You know, the one about you being willing to do anything to save your daughters? I guess so, because you just lied to me. Stephen watched in the rearview mirror as the kidnapper shook his head sadly. Let me think. What was this number? Oh, yes, exactly. $322,054.75. Sounds familiar? Olivia and Stephen exchanged glances once more. The amount was indicated down to the last cent. Olivia answered for them. Yes, that's right. No more lies, Livy girl. Otherwise, I might get the idea that you don't care what happens to your rats. Please, Olivia begged, wiping her eyes with the sleeve of her jacket. Please don't touch the girls. You'll do what I tell you and stop talking nonsense, and your girls will be fine. Olivia nodded, tears leaking from her eyes and rolling down her cheeks. The man frowned at her. Get yourself in order. You need to withdraw money, and we don't want you to give away the game with your tears, right? Olivia shook her head, rummaging through her purse for tissues and makeup. Stephen remained silent, risking a couple of glances in the rearview mirror at their captor. Twice the kidnapper stared at him, and Stephen looked away as if he had been struck. In his peripheral vision, he could see Olivia using a small sponge to apply foundation under her eyes. The trip was fairly quiet. The only sounds were their unsynchronized breathing and the noise of surrounding traffic. There was tension inside the car. Only one of the passengers appeared to be unhurt. Stephen turned onto Liverpool Street and slowed down, looking for a parking space. Out of excitement, he awkwardly parked in reverse. The man laughed. Stephen's expression became even darker. For a brief moment, everyone was silent, looking at the bank on the opposite side of the road, about 30 meters in front of them. The sound of the door opening caused Stephen and Olivia to do the same. They stood on the sidewalk and waited for instructions. Okay, missus, it's time to withdraw the money. I don't need to remind you not to warn anyone, do I? No secret messages or strange behavior to alert staff. We don't want anything to happen to your two precious babies, do we? One sign that things aren't going according to my plan and you'll never see your girls again. Is it clear? Olivia nodded, accepting the briefcase the man handed her. Tears welled up in her eyes but she brushed them away. Understood. Her voice sounded hoarse. She cleared her throat and tried again. Understood. Wait, I just remembered, Stephen said as Olivia took a step toward the curb. To withdraw money in excess of 50,000, two signatures are required. The man looked at Stephen thoughtfully, as if he were looking at a beetle under a microscope, clearly trying to evaluate Stephen's honesty. The same warning applies to you, Daddy. If I even suspect that you want to do something like Bruce Willis's Die Hard with me, I will turn off your girls. Stephen nodded sourly. Calm down, guy. 320,000 plus or minus a few is a small price to pay for your little angels. The man laughed. Is it true? Stephen nodded again. Right. Taking the briefcase from Olivia's hands, Stephen checked for traffic before heading out onto the road. Halfway through the journey, they had to stop. When he reached the opposite side, he turned to their captor and nodded. Olivia and Stephen entered the bank and headed to one of the tellers. Stephen frowned as he watched Olivia try to fill out the withdrawal slip. Her handwriting was barely recognizable. Without saying a word, he took the receipt from her, tore it up and threw it in a small trash can. He took out another and began to fill it. He handed the pen to Olivia for her to sign. He saw that her hand was shaking. One look at her face said she was hanging on by a thread. Take a few deep breaths, he whispered in her ear. We can't ruin everything. Think about Haley and Hannah. They depend on us. Olivia nodded, biting her lip. She took the pen and signed it. Tears welled up in her eyes. He will take everything, everything we worked so hard for. Stefan shrugged. What could he say? Why, Stefan? Why use? Why now? Is your firm working on any government or, I don't know, secret contracts? Stephen considered the question. The question was fair. 
he worked in the field of software for security and surveillance systems. Finally, he shook his head. Nothing that could justify it. So what about you? Have you been involved in any bad deals or made someone angry? Any CEO or CFO, uh, laid off? Have any of the middle managers been sent packing? Was anyone at the bank mad because you got promoted and he didn't? Olivia looked upset. Tears welled up in her eyes and she tried to quietly wipe them away with her fingers. I don't know. Acquisitions and mergers inevitably lead to the departure of employees and managers, and several people in my department resented me for getting promoted instead of them. Commercial banking is still a very male world. But this? To do this? Take our girls? Olivia buried her face in her hands, her shoulders shaking in an attempt to keep her emotions in check. I don't know. I really do not know. Stephen looked at his wife appraisingly. He was sure that she would not pass the teller with the bank employee. Go back to the car. I'll take care of it. One look at you, and the bank will realize that something is wrong. We can't afford any problems. Stephen expected Olivia to argue, but she didn't. With one last grateful glance, she lowered her head and walked towards the door. She walked out the door and didn't look back. Taking a deep breath, Stephen stood in one of the lines. Here, we did what you wanted, said Stephen, handing the man the briefcase. Now let us and our girls go. The man looked left, then right, and then looked at Stephen. It's funny, but I don't see anyone who would be able to dictate terms to me. The man's expression became wild. We'll be done when I say we're done. Got it, Dad. Stephen pursed his lips and nodded. The man turned to Olivia, looking her up and down patronizingly. You look a little rumpled, honey. What happened to the hot negotiator? What were you, a money-making machine? A woman with a masculine character? I have to say, I'm disappointed. The man chuckled mockingly. After all, in a crisis situation, this is not so good, right? Olivia hung her head, her shoulders slumping. Stephen had never seen her so defeated, not even after Melbourne. How does it feel to lose everything you've worked for, Mrs.? Olivia raised her head. She looked devastated. Stephen hugged her carefully. We didn't lose everything, Stephen answered quietly. Money is not everything. We still have girls and we have each other. Wow, what a philosopher, isn't he? The man grinned. Keep doing what I tell you and you will keep your daughters alive and well. But we've already done what you asked, Stephen began. But wait, that's not all, the man interrupted him, imitating the voice and intonation of a famous character from a television advertisement. Stephen shuddered, preparing himself for another onerous task. What else can we do for you? You took all our money. What else can we give you? Oh, that's easy, little lady. I want you to deliver for me. Stephen and Olivia looked at each other, confused. Why did this man need to kidnap them and their daughters for delivery? The money was clear, but the delivery... We're going to Market Street, Dad. Stephen turned the ignition key and the Range Rover whirred to life. He wedged into traffic, squeezing into the right lane, preparing to turn onto Pitt Street. The traffic was still heavy. Rush hour in the city center seemed to last all day. They crawled. Stephen was convinced that they could get to their destination faster by walking. At the junction with Bathurst Street, he turned right and shortly afterwards left onto Elizabeth. The road passed next to Hyde Park, but today, both Stephen and Olivia did not notice its beauty. But their kidnapper did not. Maybe you should spend more time in the park during your lunch break, Mrs. Maybe by the reflection pool. You know, reflect a little on your life choices. What do you have in mind? Olivia snapped, half turning around in her seat. Stephen saw her staring at the man. Now, 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 little lady. Don't come at me. It didn't take much research to figure out why you moved from Melbourne to Sydney. Looks like someone has been a naughty girl. Stephen flinched, and Olivia gasped in shock. She looked at Stephen, who stubbornly kept his eyes on the road. It was a long time ago and Stephen forgave me. We've been through this. You have no right to delve into our past and rub our faces in it. 
Oh, but I have, Mrs. This gun gives me a lot of rights, and you would do well to remember that. I'm not one of your minions. By the way, your office minions don't like you very much. So are your colleagues. I wonder why maybe you've stabbed too many of them in the back. Roughly bypass them in her climb to the top? Or is it because of your demandingness? Olivia ignored the insults. There was no point in defending herself. Commercial banking is a tough world. It was dog eat dog. As a woman, she had to be twice as ruthless as the men she worked with to be taken seriously. After Melbourne, she tried to maintain the aggressive, competitive side of her nature at work. She looked at her husband's profile. Knowing him as well as she did, she knew he was in pain. This man's jibes about Melbourne hit the mark. The sternness around Stephen's eyes, the tight lines at the corners of his mouth, the way his hands gripped the steering wheel. Everything about him spoke of suffering and the effort it took him to keep his emotions under control. Watching his silent suffering, she even forgot about her daughters for a moment. Stephen's pain was her pain, and she hated herself for being the root cause of it and her actions. She hated that she had given the kidnapper a weapon with which he could hurt her husband. She was saddened to know that the events that had happened during their stay in Melbourne could still hurt Stephen. Don't listen to him, Stephen. He's trying to drive a wedge between us. Melbourne was so long ago. We love each other. We are happy. We have two beautiful daughters. The man clapped his hands, slowly at first, then the pace increased, and then he laughed. Well done. Well done. Olivia attacked him in rage. She hated being made fun of. Why are you doing it? How do you know these things? For what? Why investigate us so diligently? None of us are famous or super rich. Well done, Mrs. My reasons are my own reasons, and you would do well to keep your attitude in check. Don't make me angry now. Not now, when one phone call can, let's say, change your whole world. Shut up, Olivia. Just do what he says, Stephen said quietly. He asked the man, What's on Market Street? What number? One hundred? answered the man. Do you know who occupies the office on the fifth floor of number 100 Market Street? No. Stephen tensed, realizing that the address might be something significant to either him or Olivia. He glanced sideways at Olivia. She turned pale, and her hands were clasped so tightly in her lap that her knuckles were white. Stephen looked at the man through the rearview mirror. He noticed his gaze and smiled smugly. What about you, Mrs.? Do you know who is on the fifth floor? Olivia turned to look out the window, ignoring the question. Surprisingly, the man did not insist on an answer. Instead, he chuckled. This sound made me cringe. Stephen turned left and immediately began looking for a parking spot. It wasn't easy. Parking spaces in the city center were always as rare as hen's teeth. But apparently the gods took care of him, or it was a man, because he found a place about a hundred meters from his destination. And again, everyone poured out of the car. Olivia looked tense and wary. Stephen looked nervous, every muscle in his body tense, like a bow about to release an arrow. The kidnapper handed Stephen an envelope the size of a document, tightly packed with contents. Olivia stumbled back, her eyes glued to the envelope. Stephen looked at her questioningly. She avoided meeting his gaze, to their surprise, he handed Stephen the phone. The man watched them both with pleasure. Perhaps I have additional instructions for you. Don't try to pretend to be a hero. Remember who has your daughters. Fifth floor, number 100, he repeated. Olivia and Stephen nodded and turned towards the office building that was their final destination. Oh no, missus. You will sit here. Hubby has to do this delivery himself. Stephen gave Olivia a questioning look again, and again she avoided looking back at him. Once Stephen was out of earshot, the man began. Can you guess what's in the envelope, Olivia? She nodded pathetically. So who was the naughty girl? Too ambitious, right? Or did you just start believing your own bullshit? You probably already know, she answered sadly. The deal depended on knowledge. The man shook his head, clearly enjoying her suffering. So, 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 insider trading. You could be in big trouble, possibly even jail time if hubby delivers the envelope to the Australian Securities and Investments Commission. 
ASIC does not approve of people who cheat and break laws. Olivia hung her head, all the fight drained from her. If what was in the envelope was what she suspected, then her career was over, life as she knew it was, over. Stephen would be shocked and disappointed in her. What will she tell the girls? Will Stephen support her in court? Will there be a wait for her if she has to go to jail? She shuddered as a bleak future opened up before her. I'll tell you what, missus. I'll give you one phone call to convince Hubby not to deliver this envelope. It couldn't be more honest than that, could it? Olivia looked up, unsure if the man was playing a trick on her or not. Hope swelled in her veins as he handed her the phone. She grabbed it with indecent haste, afraid that he would snatch it from her hands. A quick glance showed that it was her own phone, a burner phone. She suppressed the feeling of guilt. She looked at the man and, from his understanding expression, realized that the phone had been given to her on purpose. One rule. You don't have to tell him that I gave you this chance. Olivia took a deep breath to stop her hands from shaking and dialed Stephen's number. Yes? Stephen answered hesitantly. Baby, it's me. Don't deliver the letter. Olivia, I have to. He will hurt the girls if I don't do this. Believe me, please, don't deliver it. Why are you risking the safety of the girls? You know that I cannot ignore his instructions. Baby, trust me. Please just trust me. Don't give it away. Throw it in the trash can. He'll never know. Olivia looked at the man as she said the last sentence and recoiled at the smirk on his face. What is it about him that makes you so worried that you're risking Haley and Hannah? Stephen, I can't tell you. You'll just have to trust me. Please do not deliver this envelope. Please do it for me. It is important. Important for me. For us. Please just throw away the envelope. The man made a knife motion across his throat, making it clear that time was up. Olivia made one final request to him. Stephen, baby, please. Please trust me. Please do not deliver the envelope. Handing the phone back to the man, she ended the call, shaking all over. Her heart was beating wildly. Is she sure that Stephen will fulfill her request? Of course he would trust that she wouldn't put their girls at risk. Are you generally on good terms with honesty? The man asked mockingly. You have to ask yourself, who is the real criminal here? You or me? Olivia turned her face away, her cheeks flushed from his ridicule. It hit a little too close to home. After a while, Olivia risked a look at her captor and saw him take another phone out of one of his vest pockets. Her phone. She recognized the wear on the bottom corner. He pressed a few buttons. She realized that this was her PIN code to unlock the phone. How could he know such things? Olivia! Stephen's exclamation was so loud that Olivia heard it clearly despite the distance between her and her captor. Sorry, athlete. This is not Mrs. This is your worst nightmare. When you get to the fifth floor, ask your secretary or some other office hunk to take a photo of you handing over the envelope. I don't care how you do it. Just do it. Okay. Stephen answered hesitantly. Olivia wanted to yell at Stephen. Who will he listen to? Her or their kidnapper? Olivia silently asked Stephen to trust her and throw away the envelope. He should have known that she would never risk girls. She prayed as she had never prayed before. Even more than after Melbourne, every minute seemed to drag on, straining Olivia's nerves to breaking point. Why did Stephen take so long? Finally, she saw him coming towards them. There was no envelope. Did he throw it away or deliver it? He seemed to be in no hurry and lowered his head. He avoided looking not only at her, but also at the man. Who did he disappoint? Without saying a word, the man held out his hand for the phone. Stephen handed him the phone. The man opened it and went to a folder with photographs. Olivia was so tense that she was afraid she would snap. She held her breath sending out one last desperate prayer. The man handed her the phone. Stephen appeared on the screen. A plump brunette stood next to him and, smiling, accepted a thick ochre envelope. Olivia fainted, losing consciousness. The bottom had come into her world. Her bones felt like they had turned to rubber. Her knees hit the pavement, but she felt no pain. 
Her face was buried in her hands. Her shoulders heaved. Loud, convulsive sobs burst out of them. Why? Why did you deliver it? Why didn't you do what I asked? Why didn't you believe me? She wailed, looking at Stephen, her shoulders still shaking from sobs. Stephen stepped towards his wife, but the man waved him away. Oh dear, do we feel a little cheated? Have we been let down a little? Not very nice, Livy. It's not good that hubby chose me over you. Leave her alone, Stephen growled, and, ignoring the man, leaned over to help Olivia to her feet. He hugged her, stroking her back. Oh, as always, a good guy. Has it ever occurred to you that maybe that's why she doesn't respect you? Lacks killer instinct. I'll show you the killer instinct, Stephen growled, letting go of Olivia and rushing at the man. They grappled, each throwing several blows. It's sad that not a single bystander stepped forward to stop the fight. Moreover, most of them avoided them. Remember your daughter, Stephen, the man whispered, dodging another right hand. And suddenly, it was all over. Stephen deflated like a flat tire. Olivia felt his disappointment like a gust of cold wind. Get back in the car, both of you, the man barked. You have attracted enough attention to yourself. After fastening the last seat belt, Olivia turned her head. We did everything you asked of us. You took all our money and ruined my career. Please, I beg you, let us and our daughters go. We will not contact the police. We just want to go home and pick up our daughters. No, I cannot. We have one more delivery. Olivia leaned forward, shoulders slumped. She couldn't think of anything else this man could do to destroy her. Where? Stephen asked gloomily. To Chatswood. Stephen groaned. Olivia turned to him. Does he have something on you too? Did you do something illegal? Her voice betrayed her anxiety. Suddenly, she was afraid that their girls would be left without parents. What will happen to them if both she and Stephen go to prison? Stephen looked shocked and offended by Olivia's assumption. Of course, I didn't do anything illegal. If he has what I think he has, then I did something stupid, but definitely not illegal. What? Olivia asked, preparing for the worst. Nothing more than indiscreet internal correspondence about a new client who is so stupid that Tom and I can't understand how he made his millions. That's the only thing I can think of. And that's all? Olivia's relief was evident in every line of her body. Enough to get me fired, about. Very good, Stephen, said the man. Excellent deductive abilities. I understand why they pay you a lot of money. It's a shame they have to fire you. Stephen abruptly wedged the car into the traffic, causing a loud protest horn from the Toyota, which he cut off. Stephen gave the driver the finger. Their captor just laughed. Stephen changed lanes at lightning speed and accelerated to cross the intersection before the traffic light changed from yellow to red. God, 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 we're in such a hurry. I wish it would all be over soon. Everyone fell silent. The atmosphere in the car was tense as Stephen and Olivia were lost in thought while the man watched, evaluated. Olivia looked out the side window. The man systematically destroyed them. Why? She couldn't understand. Did he work for the client that Stephen disparaged in a conversation with a colleague? If so, then the revenge was very cruel. After all, does the reason matter? By the end of the day, they will have no money. Stephen's job will be in jeopardy, and there is a good chance she will be arrested. And then there are their daughters. What did this man do to them and Mrs. Foster? Olivia prayed for her girls. She couldn't bear the thought that they might get hurt. Everything else that happened was survivable, but the loss of Haley and Hannah was not. Stephen was hanging on by a thread. He just wanted it all to end. He just wanted to be home with his girls and the rest of the consequences of this day could be dealt with. Crossing the harbor bridge was, as usual, a nightmare. Once they were on the North Shore, Stephen drove like someone familiar with the area. He parked around the corner of a client's office building and turned to face their captor. Who will do the delivery? Probably you too, the man grumbled, enjoying their discomfort. You know the procedure, photo of document delivery, no fun games, blah, blah, blah. As he spoke, he handed over the phone and an envelope. 
This one was not as thick as the one that was delivered to Asik. Have fun, the man teased, laughing at his own joke. Olivia glared at him. They both watched as Stephen walked towards the corner, looking like the man on a mission that he essentially was. Why are you so cruel? If it's me, why punish Stephen? Why take our girls? Everything will be revealed, Mrs. Again these damn secrets and riddles. The man laughed. You need to learn to bring a little fun into your work day. Fun? Olivia screamed. You call this fun? Calm down, little lady. You shouldn't upset me. Not when I have your precious daughters. Olivia immediately became quiet. It went against her instincts. Usually in negotiations, she hit him right in the jugular vein. She liked to put her opponent in a difficult position. Today she felt out of place. She hated feeling so helpless, so ineffective. It felt like failure, and failure was not in her vocabulary. Olivia looked outside, eagerly awaiting her husband's appearance. When he finally came around the corner, her heart sank. He looked like a beaten man. She knew that he must feel the same helplessness, not to mention fear, that she did. As a loving father, as well as a proud and capable man accustomed to being in charge, it must have been hellish for him to be at the mercy of a kidnapper and unable to protect his children. Without saying a word, he slid into the car and handed the man the phone. He fastened his seatbelt and placed his hands on the steering wheel, awaiting his next instructions. The man chuckled as he looked at the photo. Jesus, boy, you could at least smile. Stephen pursed his lips, holding back a harsh response. Olivia reached out and squeezed his forearm reassuringly. Stephen smiled at her gratefully. Don't you want to ask where to go next? The man teased. You will tell us when you are ready, Stephen replied sharply. After all, you are in charge. The man laughed. You would make a good army officer. Even if you disagree or hate an order, you still carry it out. Stephen looked sharply at the man in the rearview mirror. Yes, I know that you served in the army, but not in the field. No, you were safe in the command center, where you helped coordinate covert operations. Others did the dirty work. Olivia looked at her husband. He never spoke about his time in the army, only once saying that he had lost too many friends to mentally reconcile his time there. My boring computer work has saved countless lives, you idiot. Many successful missions were accomplished in part because of the information I provided to the commanders leading those operations. Don't you dare mock me or these people, or I will rip your throat out with my bare hands. And if you hurt my daughters, I will tear out your heart too. The man just laughed ignoring Stephen's anger. Yes, that's what I heard, Captain. Don't take off your hat. Don't come at me. Keep doing what I tell you and everything will be fine for you and your family. Olivia could see that Stephen was unhappy with the man's answer. Why should he be happy? It was clear from his words that they still had obstacles to overcome before he would let them and their girls go. She didn't even want to think about the fact that her family wouldn't survive this day. To continue living, she had to believe. We'll see, the man said, clasping his fingers as if pondering a decision. How about we go to the Hawkesbury River? I know of a small bed and breakfast with a beautiful view of the water. With these words, Olivia realized that the whole day had been dedicated to her. She tried to maintain an upright posture and a neutral expression. How could this person know? She was so careful, no routine. There are no set days or times, no lunches or dinners, even coffee outside the office. She was sure that no one knew, nobody but Logan. Logan is her lover, her colleague. Logan, who was supposed to pick her up from the domestic terminal after Stephen was supposed to drop her off, seemed like an eternity ago. Yes, Logan, her teammate. Together they completed two major deals in one year. Transactions worth billions of dollars for the bank. Olivia wanted to hit something. She was furious. Her career is in ruins. Her family is in danger. Her husband is possibly unemployed. And for what? Never. Logan was a nobody. It didn't mean anything. He was simply a small reward that she allowed herself for a job well done. She was the same as him. He was also married and had children. He loved his wife as much as she loved Stephen. After they pulled off the first deal, 
they had a little congratulatory, week-long fling, and would occasionally date when the opportunity arose. And, having come out unscathed, both did not see any obstacles to having another small holiday fling for a few days in connection with the recent deal. It meant nothing, absolutely nothing, but now because of it, her entire life and the life of her family was in danger. Unfortunately, the knowledge that the events of that day were somehow connected with her indiscretion still did not answer the question of who was behind it. It couldn't be Stephen. He was also getting revenge, and Olivia knew that he was incapable of hurting her. If anything, he would have been the same as he was after he found out about her affair with a colleague in Melbourne. He would have been crushed, depressed, withdrawn, and asking what she needs to keep her from ending their relationship. And then there was a call from Mrs. Foster. She was terrified. There was no way Stephen could have orchestrated something like that. What about Logan? Could he have orchestrated all this to discredit her and ruin her chances for future promotion? He was ambitious and ruthless enough to throw her to the wolves. His drive to succeed was one of the things she found attractive about him. But would he risk it if she gave him away? And then there was Logan's wife. She came from old money. Her family had connections, and she would certainly have the dollars to pull off something like this. As far as she knew, Logan had experienced a similar ordeal himself. Olivia gritted her teeth in frustration. Her mind, her brilliant strategic mind, could not provide sufficiently convincing answers to determine the organizer of the events of this day. Do you understand yet, Livy? asked the man. What is he talking about, Olivia? Do you know why he does this to us? Olivia hedged, her intellect warring with her heart. Her intelligence told her that she could turn the situation around. This wouldn't be the first time she'd squeeze victory out of a seemingly inevitable defeat. Reason told her that she could put a new spin on the events of the day at the Hawkesbury bed and breakfast and spare herself the painful and awkward confession. Stephen must never find out. My heart felt differently. It said enough was enough. Her choice caused Stephen and her family more pain than she could have ever imagined. Her daughter's lives were at stake. It told him it was time to come clean and give Stephen the honesty he deserved. Yes, I understand. It's all my fault. What? What do you mean? Asked Stephen. Olivia cringed. Looking at Stephen, she felt remorse so deep that it was physical pain. It was her fault. Because of her, a stranger lost their girls, lost money, and Stephen may have lost his job. None of this is his fault. Her consequences were deserved. She had, after all, broken the law. Oh my God, it is so hard. I don't know where to start, she began, hoping that she could find the right words so that Stephen would understand and forgive her. So this is what you're like in the boardroom, Livy, asked the man. Stop beating around the bush and just let it all out, woman. Olivia turned to look at the man. Stephen waited, his hands gripping the steering wheel. Stephen, I... Oh, damn. In this last transaction, I broke the law. I... Are you saying that you transgressed it? The man interrupted. Olivia sighed. Yes, it's true. I transgressed it. I found out insider information about the stock. The deal depended on our client knowing about it, and I gave him the information. Let me get this straight, said Stephen. Did you break the law and risk our family for a deal? When you say that, it sounds reckless. Reprehensible. The bonus for us should have been at least 250000 ASIC had no reason to suspect any wrongdoing. Olivia paused when she saw the look of disgust on Stephen's face. This look devastated her. Just because you think you can get away with breaking the law doesn't mean it's okay to break the law. Honesty and integrity are about doing the right thing even when no one is looking, the man chided. Olivia shuddered. The irony of the kidnapper lecturing her about ethics and morality did not fit in her head. And what else, missus? Olivia stared at the man with the expression of a woman on her knees begging for mercy. She didn't find anything. Lowering her head and closing her eyes, she began, her voice barely audible. We work as a team on these deals. 
a small, close-knit group, each of whom has specific skills necessary to implement a project or transaction. Logan Priest and I led this team. We worked closely. I, we, uh, Olivia paused. She knew how devastating her next words would be to Stephen. At this moment, she would give anything not to say them. I, we, we had sex as a kind of internal congratulation. The car door opened. Olivia cocked her head. She looked to the side, expecting to see Stephen getting out of the car. She was wrong. Stephen was still sitting in his seat and looking at her with something like hatred in his eyes. Olivia recoiled as if struck. She turned her head first one way and then the other. The man disappeared. All that was left of him was his vest. He disappeared into the crowd. What? Where? She asked, confused. Looking around the car again, she saw that the man had taken the briefcase containing their savings. What's happening? She asked Stephen, panic-stricken. Why did he leave? He took the money. What about Haley and Hannah? How can we get him to release Mrs. Foster and the girls if he's disappeared? No, he didn't take it. He didn't take the money. What? Why? But he has girls. I do not understand what is going on. How does it feel, Olivia? What does it feel like not to understand? So that nothing makes sense? Remaining ignorant about things that matter greatly to your life? Stephen, what's going on? Stephen ignored her questions. Do you like feeling out of place? Do you like feeling insecure? Scared? Confused? Powerless? Stephen, what do you mean? What about Haley and Hannah? For God's sake, tell me what's going on. Why should I do this? Perhaps I like having my secrets as much as you like yours. What? What is wrong with you? Your words make no sense. None of this makes sense. I know, Olivia. I know about Logan Priest. I know about this deal, about insider trading. Just like I know about the previous deal and that little, aren't we such a good team, fling you had with him when you did that thing. I know about your dates. And I know all about your, uh, Midas touch. I think Logan Priest has it too. Apparently he definitely had it when he climbed into Under Your Skirt. Olivia stared at Stephen in confusion. Her mind denied her, but her body telegraphed its guilt, sending a deep red blush up her chest and onto her cheeks. Stephen couldn't know. She was so careful. But he knew. He simply said that he knew. He also knew about another affair with Logan and about their chance meetings. And he hid his knowledge from her. She felt bad. Severe cramps began in my stomach. Olivia opened the car door and leaned out, vomit gushing out with a foul odor and bitter taste, splattering the drain. Olivia swallowed, trying to get the sour taste off her tongue. She spat it into the mess she had already created on the road. Olivia took a few slow, deep breaths, trying to compose herself. Thoughts raced through my head. She tried to come to terms with the fact that Stephen had something to do with the events of that day. The fact that he was a participant in these events was so out of the ordinary that it was impossible to believe that this was the same man she married. But that was not the case. He knew. Knew everything. How could he be so cruel? How could he torture her so horribly? You must really hate me if you organize this man to kidnap the girls. Where are they? Everything is all right with them? Yes. Everything is all right with them. They are at Mrs. Foster's. They had been there since they returned from the zoo. By the way, they had a great time. But Mrs. Foster, she had a frightened voice. Yes, she did pretty well. She thought I was pranking you. She thought it was a cruel joke, but I assured her that you would appreciate it in the end. Oh, my God, Olivia whispered. She looked at Stephen, not recognizing him at all. The Stephen she knew was incapable of such cruelty, such duplicity. You made this man steal all our money? No, that's not true. Stephen reached into the back seat and pulled back his vest to show all their phones. Here, go to the banking app on your phone and check. All I withdrew was a hundred dollars. Olivia didn't move. She believed him. Everything was coming together. The whole thing was an elaborate hoax. Who is he? Nobody. You don't know him. From his tone, Olivia realized that there was no point in continuing to find out the identity of this man. 
And the papers that you delivered to ASIC? Do you want me to go to jail? You must really hate me. Stephen shrugged. The envelope contained blank paper. ASIC received almost a ream of paper from us. She won't go to jail. Olivia went limp, relief making her weak. So the delivery to your client was fake? Stephen nodded. For what? Why was it so stressful? Why do you think so? I don't know, Stephen. I don't know what to do with all this. I'm not even sure I know you. No, you probably don't know. You turned me into a new person. Congratulations. Now I have the killer instinct that you admire so much. Oh, Stephen, please don't say that. I love you just the way you are. Stephen ignored Olivia's statement. Do you really want to know why? Olivia nodded, although her instincts, which she relied on so much in the meeting room, told her that she would not like the answer. I wanted you to feel what I've been feeling for the last six to eight months. What I experienced in Melbourne seven years ago. I decided that this was the only way. If I had simply had an affair for revenge or divorced you, you would not have known the depth of my feelings. I needed you to feel what my life was like. I needed to make you feel lost and abandoned, to make you feel humiliated, betrayed, powerless, not good enough, and everything else that a betrayed spouse feels when his partner, the person who should love him above all else, stabs him in the back. You experience these feelings for less than a day, and I experience them for more than six months. And that's just this time. Oh, Stephen, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry that I hurt you. I did not want to. I never wanted you to find out. Stephen continued, ignoring Olivia's apology. Olivia, two of the worst moments in my life have been with you. Do you understand the depth of this statement? I have seen death. I was responsible for sending friends and comrades into enemy territory and watching them die for their country. Do you understand that what you did to me is much more difficult to deal with? There are few things worse than finding out that the person you dedicated your life to has betrayed you. When the person you promised to love treats you with complete disrespect. But I didn't disrespect you and I won't disrespect anyone else, Olivia countered reaching out to touch Stephen's arm. Stephen shook her hand off. It seems to me that you and I have a different idea of what respect is. You think that because you went to great lengths to hide your infidelity and didn't let your lover denigrate me, yes, I know you stopped him when he tried, that you treated me with respect. I, on the other hand, believe that by cheating behind my back, you did not respect my feelings, did not respect the vows you made to me many years ago, and did not respect my beliefs, which you knew very well and have known since then, how we got engaged, especially after Melbourne. Stephen paused, turning to look out the window. There was so much he wanted to say, but at the same time, he didn't want to spend the rest of his life talking about the end of their marriage. He had already spent enough of his life on her. Taking a breath, he decided to say as much as possible in this conversation, and then let it all happen. If his words penetrated her, it would be wonderful. Points for the good guys. If not, he will live on. A life filled with bitterness and resentment is no life at all. It's like swallowing poison every day and expecting the enemy to die. For me, being betrayed is the same as surviving death while continuing to live and breathe. The first thing that died because of your deception was our past. How much of it was real? What is a lie? I will never know because I only have your word, and your word turned out to be false. Twice. Do you know what the second death was, Olivia? Olivia shook her head, her cheeks wet with tears. The second victim was our future, the one we vowed to spend together until death do us part. We don't have a future anymore, Olivia, at least not together. You killed him. You turned him into a corpse with every secret meeting, every lie. We'll get through this, Stephen. You already forgave me once. Please try to forgive me one more time. I promise I won't let you down again. I've learned my lesson. We can move if you want. Stephen shook his head. What do you think it is? Third time lucky? On our wedding day, you promised to leave everyone else. You broke that promise in a few short years. 
Seven years ago, you promised me again that you were mine and only mine, that you will never cheat on me again. You broke that promise too. Olivia, when someone treats you with such disdain, with such dishonesty, with such disrespect over and over again, something happens to you. Little by little, your view of them changes. Your feelings change. They are decreasing. This is deceptive. It kind of sneaks up on you. I have tried. I tried damn hard to forgive and forget Melbourne. That was not easy. That was hard. It's very difficult, but I tried. First I tried for you, then for the girls. I wanted to be able to trust you, to look into your eyes and see only the smart, funny, beautiful woman I fell in love with. I didn't want to see you as the conniving, lying, selfish bitch you showed yourself to be. It's funny, but I almost succeeded. And then I again noticed that the same minor deviations were occurring. Nothing special. Just intuition, a feeling of deja vu. At first, I denied it. No, I said. She won't do that to me again. She wouldn't do that to girls, but the conviction that something was going on was still there. It grew and grew, and when I couldn't take it anymore and started checking, I discovered that my worst fears were confirmed. You betrayed me again. Lying to me again. You're stabbing me in the back again. After that, I only saw the bitch. I lost track of the girl I married. It no longer exists, if it ever existed. Yes, it exists. I'm here. I'm still the same one you married. Please, Stephen. I am so sorry it kills me to know that I hurt you. I got involved in the game, to victory. I felt invincible. You said it yourself that I have the Midas touch. Everything I touched turned to gold. Logan was just part of the game. It didn't mean anything. There was no emotion, no connection between me and Logan. It wasn't intimate. It was a sport. It was like taking a victory lap. Stephen shook his head, looking at Olivia with a look of pity on his face. Again, you and I think differently when it comes to love and sex. For you, it's just another physical activity. It doesn't matter to me whether I spend all day doing foreplay or having sex with you on the kitchen counter, rushing to finish before Mrs. Foster returns with the girls. The very act of connecting my body with yours, sharing body fluids, creates intimacy. All of this is a physical expression of my... Love that sex and love are intertwined for you, but that's not true for everyone. For some, making love is different from simply having sex with a person for whom you have no feelings for the sake of physical pleasure or relief. Can you honestly tell me that some of your pain go? Don't you see that part of the reason you're angry is because you think someone else is playing with your toys? Don't humiliate me by saying that I'm hurt and angry because of stupid pride and ego, Stephen growled. I'm not one of your superficial fuck buddies. What I felt for you goes much deeper than simple territorial jealousy. The fact that you there are women's charms does not mean that you have a monopoly on emotions. In fact, judging by your actions and this conversation, I have to say that you are the one who lacks emotions. Olivia recoiled, a look of horror crossing her face as she saw how deep Stephen's anger was. Never, not even after him in her life, she felt afraid of him. The car suddenly seemed very small to her, claustrophobia, and this was not the end. Well, Olivia, you're in luck, because from now on you don't have to worry about hurting my fragile male ego. Now you can copulate as much as you want, and with anyone. Any Tom, Dick, or Harry can play with your toys. I don't care anymore. I want and need a partner who shares my beliefs. You don't, and so it's time for us to go our separate ways. But I love you, and despite what you say, I know that you love me. Stephen shrugged. Once upon a time I loved you. There was a time when I also loved to smoke. I really enjoyed it but I quit when I realized that I was being stupid and that I was risking my health and my future by continuing to smoke. Staying with you would be stupid. I would be risking my mental and emotional health and chances for a happy future. I'd be a fool to trust you again. It's stupid to trust you and your word again. I'm not stupid. Was. 
but not now. You wouldn't be stupid, Stephen. You would be loving and forgiving. I will spend the rest of my life making amends to you. Seeing how hurt you are, how far what I did has taken you, I would never take that risk again. Stephen sighed. You don't understand, Olivia. You just don't understand. Let me give you an analogy. If you had to guess the funniest thing we did with the girls last summer, what would it be? What did we do that they then talked about for months? Olivia looked puzzled, but answered, We went to an amusement park on the Gold Coast, the world of white water. That's right, and the girls couldn't get enough. They really liked it. Trips to the beach and river couldn't compare. This is what your business is like. Sweet, dependable old hubby, tinkering with the lawnmower at home, up to his elbows in dishwater, reading books to two six-year-olds, is no match for Mr. Three-Piece Suit, Mr. Arrogant Banker. I don't excite you anymore. I'm not illegal. I'm not new and unknown. I'm still the same. Still the same. Still the same. I'm not what you rewarded yourself with. Whether you admit it or not, you will always remember your novels. They will always be your delightful escapes from married life. You'll remember them when you're bored or when I can't express myself in the bedroom. I can't. Correction. I won't try to compete with fantasy. I wouldn't. I swear I wouldn't. Stephen shook his head sadly. You deny everything, Olivia. Can you honestly tell me that you never thought about your affairs? Maybe when I'm out of town? Or when you're out of town? Olivia couldn't answer. Stephen was right. She remembered. Exactly. Stephen nodded, not needing her confirmation to know he was right. It's bad that you do this when I'm not around. Can you imagine what it's like to lie next to you night after night and wonder who you're dreaming about? Making love to you and not knowing whether you're making love to me or putting one of your lover's faces on mine? You can't know how soul-destroying it is because you've never experienced it, and with your attitude towards sex, you probably never will. But Stephen... Stephen grabbed the steering wheel, slightly hitting his head on the rim. Olivia looked at him in alarm. Has he finally lost his head? But nothing. Olivia, haven't you learned anything today? Everything that happened was meant to make you feel something beyond the surface level. Pain, fear of loss, powerlessness, betrayal, abandonment, anger. You felt them. You felt them all. I know you did it. I've been watching you. Why do you think I organized this? I don't know. To punish me? Olivia whispered. No, not to punish. It was because in the last eight months, I had felt all of that and more. I never thought that after Melbourne, I would ever have to feel them again, at least in relation to you. But I did it. I had to. You did this to me. Remember today. Remember how you felt. Maybe the next time a man loves you, you'll think twice before stabbing him in the back. I... Oh God, Stephen, please don't give up on us. I need you. I love you. I want to grow old with you. With Logan, it wasn't lovemaking. It was recreational sex. No more meaningful than going out and playing squash. Olivia, you're repeating yourself. Maybe it didn't mean anything to you, but it meant something to me. This is what you keep forgetting. Our relationship was not only about you. They touched me too. Do you understand that you ruined my love for you? Ruined our life together for the sake of what you call recreational sex? I want to rip your heart out of your chest and trample on it, because that's exactly what you did to me. Want to know some statistics about sex? Stephen didn't wait for Olivia's answer. The average person spends about six months having sex over the course of an average life. Yes, that's all. Six months. Women spend twice as much time just deciding what to wear. That's why you betrayed me. You will spend less time on this than choosing shoes for your suit. Stephen shook his head as if shaking off rain. He ran his hand through his hair. Enough. This will get you nowhere. You do not understand. Maybe you'll never understand. Maybe you are not capable of this. Stephen's words repeated in Olivia's head in circles. You do not understand. Maybe you'll never understand. Maybe you are not capable of this. Olivia shuddered, remembering the roller coaster ride she had been on, feeling fear and uncertainty, isolation and disappointment, feelings of betrayal and loss. It was terrible, the worst thing she had ever experienced, and that's exactly how she made Stephen feel. 
Olivia swallowed back tears of devastation. She had hurt the man she loved in the most horrific way. She believed in her heart that if her indiscretions were discovered, he would forgive her. After all, he forgave her last time. What arrogance. Stephen was right. She didn't respect him and was dismissive of his feelings. She pushed him to extremes in an attempt to reach her and make her understand. Olivia panicked. Her crimes against Stephen were so great, but she loved him, really loved him. Stephen couldn't give up on her, on their relationship. He and the girls were the most important thing in her life. She had to let him know that. Stephen. Stephen raised his hand. Enough. I said enough. After checking the rearview mirror, Stephen started the engine, clicked the indicator, and drove out onto the roadway. Do you like making deals, Olivia? Stephen didn't wait for an answer. They both knew the question was rhetorical. Well, that's it. You are buying an apartment I'm buying, too. The girls stay at the house with Mrs. Foster. It's not fair to them to deprive them of the only home they've ever known just because you couldn't resist rewarding yourself with a little recreational sex. Olivia winced as she heard Stephen say her own words just a few minutes ago. From his lips, they sounded stupid. Ridiculous. Stephen continued, either not knowing or not caring about her reaction. This means that you and I will go back and forth. A week there, a week off. No child support for either of us. No alimony. We open an account into which we deposit equal amounts and from which all household and Haley and Hannah-related expenses are paid. Regardless of personal feelings, we remain polite. I won't say anything negative about you. You will do me the same courtesy. If we are both attending the same event, we will be polite and cordial. Stephen's calm, emotionless voice unnerved Olivia. She had never seen this side of him. And Olivia, make no mistake, there will be no negotiations. This is a take-it-or-leave-it proposition. You will upset me, you will resist, and I will forget all my good intentions to spare the girls the knowledge that their mother is a lying, law-breaking whore and hand over the real documents to ASIC. If it were up to me, that's exactly what I would do. I couldn't have enjoyed anything more than sitting in a courtroom and watching the prosecution pin your ass and your lover's ass against the wall. I would laugh when they sentence you. The longer the term, the more I would laugh. You are just lucky that you gave me two beautiful daughters. For their sake, I will show mercy. For their sake, I will restrain my desire to bury you. Olivia looked out the passenger side window, but didn't see anything. She was late. The epiphany came to her too late. She knew defeat. She often saw him on the other side of the conference table. Her marriage was over. She lost. Olivia seated at the front of the church. She looked up and around, admiring the beautiful, stained glass windows. Without turning her head in the opposite direction, she knew that Stephen and his wife Lauren were sitting at the opposite end of the bench. Lauren. God, how she hated this woman. She was ten years younger than her and different from her as night from day. Light-skinned compared to dark Olivia. Short compared to tall Olivia. Blue-eyed and angelic compared to the gloomy and gloomy Olivia. But Olivia didn't hate her for her looks or her age. She despised Lauren because her daughters adored her. Because Stephen loved her. Because he looked at Lauren the same way he once looked at her. Stephen now looked at Olivia as if she were invisible. And had done so for over twenty years. Olivia hated that 22 years after they broke up, she still missed Stephen. She wished she could hate him for it. But how can you hate the man by whom you evaluate all other men? She hated Lauren for being everything she wasn't, for the way her daughters admired her. They hugged her at every opportunity. They should admire her, their real mother. Instead, they were more formal with her. It wasn't fair. Didn't she show them how a woman could have both a family and a career? Didn't she show them an example of a successful businesswoman? They should look up to her, admire her, respect her. Wasn't she always perfectly groomed? Is she still as slim as she was in her 20s? Didn't she break the glass ceiling and earned a six-figure salary for most of her life? Didn't she have good taste? Wasn't she cultured? Why then did they honor Lauren in particular? Lauren, who they went to for advice? Of course, this woman managed a chain of fashion boutiques and, as the girls were happy to tell her, 
she worked her way up from the very bottom, but does this give her the right to be a lifesaver for girls? Olivia chuckled mentally. Lauren probably slept her way to the top because she was so damn lacking in killer instinct. Olivia knew that her words were both false and unfair, but she couldn't help herself. In her opinion, Lauren had usurped her role as both a wife and a mother. Olivia looked to her right at Mrs. Foster's profile. She was no longer young, and Olivia felt some satisfaction that age was catching up with the old bird. Mrs. Foster, a silly old lady, adored Lauren too. Olivia couldn't understand why the girls insisted on Mrs. Foster being with them today. They haven't needed a nanny for ten years. It was Stephen's fault. Even after the girls left school, he insisted that Mrs. Foster stay in her small apartment. Olivia was lost in thought as organ music began to play in the background. She tried to let the music penetrate her soul and rid her of her bad mood. The reason for her bad mood was the news she had received the previous afternoon. She couldn't believe that the head office had decided to promote the little slut she had raised so well. She taught the bitch everything she knew, and the little upstart outran her and stole the promotion Olivia thought was hers. This was the third time in the last five years that she had been overlooked. It was annoying. The priest cleared his throat and brought Olivia back to the present. She didn't know why Haley wanted to baptize her firstborn since they never went to church. Olivia could only assume that this was what Haley's husband, Jasper, wanted. Olivia listened to the ceremony with half an ear while the priest read the usual nonsense. Haley turned to the assembled family and friends, and this caught Olivia's attention. Their eyes met for a brief moment before Haley turned them to her father and Lauren. Olivia heard the priest ask Haley's parents to stand and come forward. Olivia immediately placed her purse on the floor next to her feet and stood up. She frowned. Lauren stood up too and walked towards Haley and Jasper, holding Stephen's hand tightly. A hand on her forearm made Olivia look down. Not you, dear. Haley and Jasper asked Stephen and Lauren to be Cody's godparents, Mrs. Foster whispered softly. Embarrassed, Olivia nearly fell back onto the bench. She sat there, stunned, as Haley gave a little speech about why she asked her dad and Lauren to be Cody's godparents. Dad, you were as close to ideal as possible as a father. All of Hannah's friends and my friends were jealous that we had such a wonderful father. You always knew when to be strict and when to be soft, when to scold us and when to be lenient. You always listened to us and always let us know that we came first for you. And then you brought Lauren into our lives and made our little family perfect. Lauren, you are everything I hope to be as a woman and as a mother. Whenever I don't know what to do, I ask myself, what would Lauren do? What would Lauren say? I know Hannah does the same. And in all these years... Following this method of solving problems, I have never made a mistake. Thank you for being you. Thank you for loving Hannah and me like we were your own. Jasper and I both agree that if anything had happened to us, we couldn't have found two people we'd rather have raised our son, our precious Cody. Tears rolled down Olivia's face. Not tears of joy for a daughter or grandson, but tears of sadness, pain, and yes, anger. How could Haley make such a speech knowing that her mother was in the audience? She should have known how hurtful and humiliating her words would be to Olivia. Olivia wanted to run out. She would have done so if it hadn't meant that more people would have to witness her shame. But even when she was choking with anger and resentment, a quiet voice tried to be heard. At first weak but every moment more and more loud and demanding attention. What goes around comes around. A kaleidoscope of images from the past flashed through Olivia's head. Each one showed missed opportunities, missed birthdays, missed events, missed breakfasts, and missed bedtimes. Times when she could have been there for her daughters, but chose to prioritize work instead. At first, it had been easier to leave their care to Mrs. Foster to escape their sad, accusing eyes and avoid the endless, awkward questions about why she and their dad took turns living with them. Guilt helped me stay away from home. By immersing herself even more in her career, she was able to hide from the shame and sense of responsibility for what happened. The more hours she worked, the more relieved she felt. Yes, 
it is much easier to kiss a sleeping child than an offended and awake one. Later, when the path was already well trodden, everyone simply accepted it, and before she knew it, they had already graduated from high school and entered the university. By that time, they no longer needed her. The realization hit and hit hard, knocking all the strength out of her. For almost her entire adult life, she has made poor choices. She chose avoidance instead of accepting and correcting the situation for her daughters. She chose material success over love. She chose money and prestige, status and career, not family. A career that had been dying a slow and painful death for five years now. Olivia leaned against the hard wooden back of the bench. She was alone. They had each other. With her speech, Haley made it clear that, in her eyes, Olivia was not her mother, not in the real sense of the word. She was only an egg donor. Olivia could no longer avoid the truth. She had failed in the most important role of her life. Stephen, Lauren, the girls and their spouses had a tight-knit circle of love and support. She didn't have anyone. She will never be part of their circle. She will never know love the way they knew it. Defeat and loss, Olivia discovered, are worse than death. Death gave you a pardon from choice. Defeat and loss had to be lived with. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.